Hi, my name is Wouter Emery and I'm the founder of Airship. Today we're here at UCLA to teach aerodynamics, but first a little word on this project. Go ahead, Oli. What is this all about? Yeah, hi, my name is Oli Krauss. I'm the Mechanical Technical Director here at uh, UCLA Bruin Super Mileage. So each year we build a hyper-efficient fuel-efficient, or hyper-efficient electric vehicle to compete in the Shell Eco Marathon. Um, this year's vehicle we managed to place third place, achieving uh, around 30 miles per kilowatt hour. Um, we have a team of around 50 active members um, and we're divided into various sub teams. So, as a mechanical technical director, I mostly focus on steering and structures, um, but we also have a powertrain and electrical team as well. Um, something that's really unique about our competition is that um, you know, we have to build everything by ourselves and we do most of it in house. So, not only did we do the lamp for this chassis, but we also built the CNC machine to machine the mold to do the lamp on the chassis. And you know, the same thing extends into our powertrain system as well. So, we build all our custom speed controllers. Uh, data acquisition system, telemetry system, etc. Um, and uh, we're really honored this year to be working with the Glove Turn Air Shaper um, to optimize the aerodynamics of our upcoming vehicle. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Oli. Yeah. So let's get to class and talk about those aerodynamics. Alrighty, let's go. Hi everyone and welcome, and thanks for showing up. Uh, it's better than an empty classroom, definitely. Um, so today we're going to talk about aerodynamics, and the goal is that I first cover some principles of aerodynamics, um, just so that everyone has a similar framework. Um, so I don't know what your backgrounds are, but I understood from the introductions earlier that it's quite diverse, so mechanical, electronical engineering, computer engineering, and so on. Um, so let's go through the basics first, and then we can actually discuss um, the super mileage design. Let's see if this works. No. Why not? Like this then. So first of all, yeah, what is aerodynamics? Um, basically anything that moves through the air or anything that is exposed to air moving across the object, um, that covers aerodynamics um, in a nutshell. So so that means it applies to trains, uh, to boats, buses, trucks, airplanes, uh, athletes, and so on. And there's two basic ways of testing it. One is the wind tunnel, where you physically force air across the object to measure what's going on with load cells and so on. Or you can do it virtually using computer simulations. Um, there's other stuff in between, like just road testing, tough testing, and so on. But we'll cover that later. Um, first of all, does aerodynamics matter? Well, it depends on the speed and some other things. So. If you, if you talk about uh, the super mileage card, for example, um, there's two main categories of resistance or the stuff that slows it down or keeps it from just going at the same speed. Um, one is the mechanical resistance, which is the combination of uh, rolling resistance of the tires on the ground, uh, drivetrain resistance, um, other auxiliaries that need to be powered. So mechanical resistance. And then there's aerodynamic resistance, which is the resistance of the air. Um, now, the fun thing is that um, the mechanical resistance is almost constant, not exactly constant, but almost constant uh, in function of velocity. Um, but the aerodynamic resistance actually squares, uh, scales with the square of the velocity, uh, which means that if you double the speed, the aerodynamic drag goes up by a factor of four, which is dramatic, which is why at some point, which you could call the crossover point, aerodynamic resistance becomes more important than the mechanical resistance. And then the question is, what, what's the crossover point? So, well, the speed is not the same for every application. It kind of depends on your mechanical resistance and the size of your object and the aerodynamic efficiency. Um, so if you're cycling, for example, um, that's a very lightweight system with still a sizable frontal surface area, which means that aerodynamics are quite important relative to the mechanical resistance. Uh, so low mechanical resistance, high aerodynamic resistance, which means that at 20, 30 kilometers per hour, for example, um, or 15 miles per hour, you would already see that aerodynamics become dominant versus the mechanical resistance. Um, for cars, you would probably guess that it's around, yeah, I'm used to kilometers per hour, but let's say 50 miles per hour, something like that. And then for trains, which are massive objects with a lot of mechanical resistance and a fairly small frontal surface area, uh, you need to speed up to a lot more to actually see that crossover point. But that's just in terms of the forces. If you then look at the actual power, uh, so power is actually force multiplied by velocity, uh, irrespective of aerodynamics, that's just the basic law. Um, that means if your aerodynamic drag scales with the square of velocity, the aerodynamic power or the, the energy that you need to push the airway actually scales with the third power of the velocity. So that's huge. And that explains why with a Volkswagen Golf GTI, 
for example, um, you can go 200 kilometers per hour uh, with, let's say, 125 horsepower. The Bugatti Veyron, on the other hand, needed a thousand horsepower, uh, horsepower just to go twice as fast. And that is basically because it scales with a factor eight if you double the speed. That is how important aerodynamics is, and that is how difficult it is to just take a car from 200 km per hour to 220 km per hour. It just scales dramatically. Um, there are actually two main components to aerodynamic drag. Uh, so one component is the pressure drag, which is the air pushing and pulling perpendicular to the surface. So you can have high pressure pushing on the surface or negative pressure pulling on the surface, which is typically what you would use to generate downforce on the Formula One or an Indy car using the underfloor, using the wings and so on. Second component of drag is what we call the friction drag, um, which is where the air slides across the surface, parallel to the surface. So instead of perpendicular, it's parallel to the surface. And this generates friction, and this friction is also a component of drag. Now, the more streamlined your object is, the lower the pressure drag, and the more important the friction drag becomes. If you're working on an aircraft, for example, you can easily see friction drag going to 50% or more. Um, if you're working on a, on a car, however, which is a fairly blunt object in most cases, you would see that pressure drag is, for example, 90% of your drag. Just to give, give you an indication on how we calculate the drag force. So the drag force is half of the density multiplied with the square of velocity. That's just your factor to indicate what is the turbulent kinetic, oh, sorry, what is the kinetic energy in your airstream. Um, that's just a physical quantity there. And then we multiply it with the drag coefficient, which is a dimensionless number, which indicates to what extent your object is streamlined, whether it's small or big object, that's irrespective of that. It just indicates is it streamlined or not. So a drop shape is very streamlined, uh, but like a square or a box it is not streamlined at all. Um, so your drag coefficient who can go anywhere from, let's say, around one for a boxy shape to 0 0.04 for a very smooth drop shape. And then we have to take into account the size of an object. Um, this is what we call A, the frontal surface area. Uh, which is the last factor in this equation. And this one takes into account how big the object is. Um, so, for example, um, if you take the same sphere and you just double the size, um, but that's two dimensions, so actually squared. Uh, so that's four times the frontal surface area, which means the drag will go up by a factor four if the drag coefficient stays the same, which is not always the case, but in this simplified formula, it is the case. Um, keep this in mind, though, because a lot of companies will especially car companies, will advertise their impressive CD coefficient. Like, oh, well, this new Lucid Air, for example, has a drag coefficient of 0 0.2, for example, which is really very impressive. But take into account that the frontal area is also important, because in the end, what determines the amount of energy that you need to push your, air, uh, your car through the air is actually what they call CDA, which is drag coefficient multiplied with frontal surface area. That's the most important one, because like the Rivian, the R1T, for example, which is pickup truck, electric pickup truck, uh, made here in California, or actually designed here in California, has a drag coefficient of 0 0.3, which is very efficient compared to 0 0.45 for uh, a Ford F-150, for example, but still a huge thing. So A is still very big on an SUV, whether it's aerodynamic or not, it's still a big, chunky object. Uh, so keep in mind that to determine your range, if you have a certain energy content in your battery, you need to look at CDA and not just CD. Another thing uh, or parameter which is typically very important in aerodynamics is called the Reynolds number. Now, this number is actually the ratio between your inertia forces, so how fast you can accelerate and decelerate something, compared to the viscous forces, which is actually the shear, uh, kind of some kind of damping that you have if you would move air and, and slide different layers of air across each other. Uh, so just to kind of get a feeling of this, um, if you would accelerate something, um, well, if you have a lot of viscous forces, it kind of slows down quite a lot, or the energy decays quite a lot, or dis uh, dissipates quite fast. Um, so this Reynolds number is not a real physical quantity, but um, it's kind of an indication uh, to know in what kind of flow regime your application will be. So you can roughly use this to say, okay, I'm, wor I'm working on a wind turbine blade, which has a Reynolds number of so much. Is it comparable to cars? Yes or no. So can I use more or less the same techniques to reduce drag, to optimize lift, and so on. Um, another concept is the difference between laminar flow 
and turbulent flow. So if you look at the flow through a pipe, which is the one at the top left there, if, if you would trace particles through the pipe individually, and you just kind of color the path that they follow, um, if the streamlines are all nicely parallel and horizontal in this case, um, you can call this a laminar flow. Um, but if all of those paths are kind of crossing through each other and kind of uh, featuring a very swirly uh, pattern with a lot of eddies, then, it, then we talk about turbulent flow. Um, for example, if you turn on the faucet and you have like a nice stream of water, then it's laminar flow. But if you turn it up even more uh, because you increase the speed and thus the Reynolds number, it can actually turn turbulent um, and then it's full of bubbles and vortices and so on, um, just as a rough indication. Um, so we saw this very simplified formula here, saying that your drag force is just uh, a, a product of these factors, including the drag coefficient. Now, the thing is, this drag coefficient is not constant. Um, even though it's nice to believe it is, it actually isn't. Um, if you look at this graph, this is the drag coefficient of a sphere. Um, and here we can see if you test it at different speeds, and if all the other factors are the same, this translates into a Reynolds number scale. Um, you can see that if you go from, let's say, a Reynolds number of 10 or 100 uh, with a drag coefficient of more than 1, if you speed up, um, it actually drops to kind of to 0 0.5. And then you see this, this dip here, which is very interesting. This is called a drag crisis uh, or a dip in, in the um, drag coefficient curve. You can see that it can go as low as almost 0 0.1. For the exact same object, just a different speed or a different size, both of which change the Reynolds number. Um, <clears throat> so you'll very often see in literature that the drag coefficient for this object is this much. Yeah, that's true, but it's actually only true for one single velocity or one single size velocity point. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, so if you optimize your car for 70 miles per hour and you calculate the drag coefficient, it's not necessarily exactly the same drag coefficient at 10 or 20 miles per hour. Um, it can change slightly it can change dramatically um another note on what happens close to a surface um we talked about friction coefficient before um and the funny thing is that if you have even a perfectly smooth surface like the surface of an airfoil for example even if the roughness is, is close to zero um the rz or ra value um you will still have zero velocity on the surface that's kind of a funny concept to grasp but even if it's perfectly smooth exactly on the surface the air is standing still which means that in between standing still and moving along at free stream velocity so the air just outside your airplane a few meters away in between there, there has to be some kind of gradient to go from zero to the velocity outside um, this is what we call a velocity profile and the condition or the fact that it's always zero on surface is called a no slip condition um, now, this profile is actually very important. Um, when they talk about a boundary layer uh, velocity profile, that's what they're talking about. So you can have a profile which uh, very quickly goes to like the constant velocity or the free stream velocity, or one that actually moves slower. Um, so there's all kinds of profiles, depending on whether the flow is laminar, like we saw before, nicely parallel or turbulent. And what can also happen that is that Imagine you have a flow across across this, this. Imagine this is a plate and you have a flow across this plate. Imagine it hits the plate over here. Um, it doesn't stick to it yet because it hasn't seen the plate yet. But as it starts to move across the plate, it starts to stick to it. And there's an air, a, a layer of air sticking to it. And on top of that layer, the next layer of air is sticking to it. Of course, it's not a discrete thing. It's a continuous thing. But you can imagine that the further you travel down this plate, the thicker this layer grows. And this is your boundary layer, which is developing on the surface. Now, at some point, it can happen that this boundary layer, which is nicely laminar, uh, actually transitions, transitions, transitions into one which is actually turbulent, which is completely different and features a different velocity profile. Um, and this is quite important to actually uh, get a grab or a hold on the drag coefficient, uh, especially for airfoils. This is very important. Um, then. A very typical case, we often get the question, should I just cover my car with golf ball dimples? Well, the answer is probably not, um, because what happens, just to illustrate the golf ball dimple uh, example, is that the air hits the front of the golf ball. And just like we saw on a flat plate, um, if the air has to curve around the golf ball, again, the flow will start to build up and you get this boundary layer, which will grow thicker and thicker and thicker. And the thing is that in the boundary layer, because it's slower moving air, uh, there's less momentum, less energy. 
But if you want to curve, uh, follow the curve of the golf ball beyond the midpoint, which means you're contracting again, you somehow need energy to stay attached to that surface. And you don't, if you don't have enough energy or enough momentum in the boundary layer, um, instead of following the curvature, at some point it will let go. Can you see my curve? No, you can't. Um, okay, so where the green zone ends, uh, on the top left figure, that's where the flow decides to stop following the curvature of the golf ball and starts to just uh, go back to a horizontal track, which is called uh, a separation uh, location. Which means that the size of the wake, which is the whole bunch of uh, red arrows there, um, a turbulent wake that you have there, is actually fairly big in diameter compared to the golf ball. So what happens if you add dimples? If you add dimples, uh, what happens is the flow starts to be more nervous on the surface and you start to mix energy from the flow outside the boundary layer with energy inside the boundary layer and you create a turbulent boundary layer so you get kind of small swirls inside this boundary layer and a turbulent boundary layer has more momentum more energy and is able to stick to a curved surface surface for longer before it actually separates and you can clearly see that this this vertical blue arrow that you see in the right um, is actually smaller, indicating that the, the, the diameter uh, or the cross-section of the wake has actually been reduced because of these dimples. Theoretically, you would only need dimples at the front of the golf ball uh, because you don't need them in the wake, but you don't know which is the front of a golf ball. That's where they're just all over the place. That's actually why golf balls have dimples and why they have them all over the place. So is this applicable to cars? No, uh, especially not on modern cars. So this helps if you have a flow which is separating at some point because the curvature is too steep like if you would go back 20 30 years you would see like a typical design uh, sedan uh, design of a car had a very steep rear windscreen and it was too steep so the flow would actually separate and there theoretically you could work with uh, golf ball dimples on the rooftop for example or with vortex generators generators to energize the boundary layer uh, to keep the flow attached to the rear window but these days the much better solution is to just begin with a silhouette or a profile of the car, which is just soft and smooth enough so that you don't have to fix it at all with golf ball dimples. And that results in a much lower drag to begin with, which is why it doesn't make sense these days anymore to apply golf ball dimples to cars, unless it's like an exception or something. Um, yeah, this is just an example um, of flow separation. Let's let's look, look at this one uh, without diving into the theory because I'm not good at it. Um, the flow across a sphere, so let's say this is a golf ball but without dimples, um, it hits the front, which means you have Pmax, which is your highest pressure, which is what we also call the stagnation pressure, which is where the flow comes to a complete standstill. Uh, this direction, complete standstill, and this is the higher pressure, highest pressure that you can get. Um, and then it starts to accelerate and curve around this, um, this sphere, which means that it speeds up. And as the air speeds up, pressure goes down. This is what, the, what is called the Bernoulli equation. Um, and it's at, as it reaches the midway point, beyond the midway point, it starts to decelerate again, uh, decelerate again uh, which means that you have a negative pressure gradient. The pressure starts to rise again. And this is kind of a tricky point um, because the pressure at the rear starts to hold back the flow which is coming in and it will help actually kick the air off the surface at some point and you get flow separation. Um, I'll skip this stuff, it's a bit too much uh, theory there, uh, but just I'll send the slides later on. Um, so you will see that at some point you have the red dot which is the separation location. Beyond that point you actually have reverse flow um, diving into the wake which is there um, behind the separation location. So the dotted red line is actually the uh, kind of the, the the boundary of your wake so where the flow actually starts to separate and go straight ahead and within that wake you have a recirculation in the air going up um okay that was that was the the boring stuff um let's see if you want to solve this with um cfd or computational fluid dynamics what we do is that um, instead of solving this with a continuous equation, which we don't have for industrial applications, we can only solve this for like a theoretical case, like, like flow through a pipe or something. There we have mathematical equations. But basically anything more than that, we don't have mathematical equations to describe the flow around a Formula 1 car, for example. Um, so what we do is we chop up reality into small blocks. And for each of those blocks, which are squared or, or like a pyramid, depending on your type of mesh, 
we can solve the equations. Uh, so in a very pragmatic way, we can only solve them for a very simple thing, like a cube. Okay, let's make uh, 10 million cubes uh, to describe our geometry. That's the basic principle of a finite volume method. Um, now, the thing is, just like when you take a digital photograph of something, um, if you want to describe something that curls, for example, you cannot describe it if your pixels are bigger than the actual curl that you're trying to describe. Um, so the more details you want to capture in your flow, the smaller the blocks need to be. Uh, and that is why th th uh, the top picture, you see that the blocks are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, the closer we're getting to the surface, um, because that's where the flow gets complex. So typically, if you want to build your mesh, which is this division of space into small blocks or cells, you want to do it intelligently uh, so that you spend most of them um, close to the surface where they actually matter. And you can do this based on experience, or you can do this adaptively so that the computer algorithm automatically makes them smaller where the flow is more complex, which means you need some iterative procedure. Um, so there's basically three types of errors. The modeling error, I talked about the equations that we can solve for these small blocks. Well, choosing the right, uh, um, the right equations is actually step one. If the equations that you're choosing are not correct, well, you introduce an error. Or if you don't introduce enough equations, for example, if you ignore thermal effects, for example, if you ignore the gravitational pull of the moon, for example, you introduce errors. So it's up to you to decide which equations you want to take into account. Then you have the discretization error, and this relates to the size of these blocks. Uh, so the bigger the blocks, the bigger this uh, discretization error, um, because you're just losing information if you have big blocks or big pixels in a photograph. Um, plus, you have to discretize your equations. And then the last one is that once you do all of this, get the equations for each single block, you get the matrix with literally millions and millions of equations you have to solve. Um, uh, instead of solving them all directly, uh, which would be prohibitively expensive, you use iterative method, methods, which means you start with a guess and then you start to iterate through the guesswork, try and make a new guess based on the previous one, and step by step you try and converge, which is what you see in this graph. So initially you get lots of oscillations and, and then the solution kind of converges to a stable solution, which is hopefully close to the real solution. But again, the, the sooner you cut off this iterative process, uh, the bigger um, the error is on average. So um, let's skip this one. I'll show you this later on. Uh, just to describe the alternative, which is physical wind tunnels. In physical wind tunnels, um, you just force air through a tunnel, you put your object in the middle, and you analyze the forces, you visualize the flow, and so on. Uh, that's the basic concept. Um, now, there's plenty of um, options to do this. Uh, if you want to save energy, you want to actually close the circuit, which means that if you force air through the tunnel, you want to recuperate that energy and just make it go around. Um, that's a lot more energy efficient, but there's some downsides because the if you keep doing this, all of that energy that you still have to add to it uh, will heat up the flow, for example, which changes the density, which changes the properties of your flow. Um, if you go through some of the components, uh, you'll see that if you want to uh, make the air go around the corner, you need turning veins. Otherwise, you get turbulence again and bad flow quality, which is uh, these blue arcs here. Um, you have your, your fan, obviously, <clears throat> which can be one massive fan or multiple smaller fans. Um, by the way, this is a human, uh, so they, they can get quite big. Oh yeah, sorry, uh, you can't see my cursor. Uh, like the white dot in the fan, that's actually a person standing there. Uh, so some wind tunnels are actually huge. Um, then as the flow comes around the corner, um, it has all kinds of swirls in it, as you can imagine, because it just went through a corner, different speeds inside the corner, outside, outside of the corner, um, different swirls, different turning veins. Um, so you want to straighten the flow. Uh, and you do this with a honeycomb structure, which is just a set of tubes, a lot of tubes uh, to make the flow, force the flow to move in a parallel way, actually, um, which is what you see in the, the graph there illustrated. And then you force them through a screen because the, the flow velocity might still be different uh, depending on which tube the flow enters into. Um, so what they add typically is a screen. So a screen is, is just like a maze or something, uh, small holes, and it adds a pressure resistance which means that faster moving flow will have more resistance because the pressure resistance is scaling with the square of velocity. So you actually penalize the flow, which is going fast, which means that it slows down and gets closer to the average velocity. Um, and that kind of normalizes the flow. 
you have to break up these small swirls that you have in the flow as well. Um, and then you want to do this on a big diameter so you don't lose too much energy. Um, and then you start to contract the flow and accelerate it, uh, which is um, the small trumpet or tube that you see there. You accelerate the flow um, and then it speeds up um, as you get to the test section. And the test section is the smallest bit of your wind tunnel in which you place your object. And once you get there, um, you need to know how fast the tunnel is going. So you put some pitot tubes there, which are small metal tubes to measure pressure from which you can deduct the velocity. You can calibrate that. And then you put your object into the wind tunnel and you start measuring uh, the forces, the moments, uh, visualizing the flow and so on. Um, now, a funny thing is that if you put an object in your tunnel, you actually impact the average flow velocity because the flow now needs to go around your object, which is the middle graph here which is a smaller cross-section of the wind tunnel compared to when there's no object inside. So imagine you calibrate your wind tunnel without any object, which kind of makes sense, right? There's nothing in there. Uh, and you say, now it's going at uh, 10 miles per hour. If you then put an object inside, the average flow velocity of the air going around the car is actually maybe 11 miles per hour because the cross-section has been reduced. And you have to take this into account uh, because imagine you're measuring the forces thinking, oh, this is for 10 miles per hour. It's actually not true. You're measuring the forces as if the air was going at 11 miles per hour, for example. Um, and this is called a blockage factor, um, which is something that you can calculate and you can compensate for. Not perfectly, but you can actually do something. And typically they would recommend to keep the blockage factor, which is the ratio between the frontal area of your object versus the cross-sectional area of the tunnel to keep that below five to 10%, depending on the application. Another thing is that if you place your object in the wind tunnel, your, your blockage factor may be low, but some geometries like a wing profile have a very dramatic effect on the airflow, which means that if you have an airplane around the tips, for example, you can have wingtip vortices, which are large swirls that kind of curve out um, uh, bottom to top. Um, and these can hit the virtual walls of the real walls of the wind tunnel, um, which means that you're kind of blocking these vortices, which means that you're impacting the actual flow structure. It's not just a virtual speed up, you're actually changing the way the air flows around the object. So you have to be very careful and that's where CFD simulations can also be useful. If you run a simulation up front, you can actually check the flow structure around your object and see if you want to actually use a bigger tunnel or not. Problem is, the bigger the tunnel, the more expensive. That's why you kind of take the smallest one, which is still acceptable in most cases. I'll skip uh, one remark, maybe. Um, if you do a wind tunnel test, um, you cannot always test the full size object. Uh, if you want to test like a Boeing or something, um, it's quite difficult to find a wind tunnel to fit your Boeing inside, especially if the blockage ratio has to be lower than 5%. So you can often test a scaled model. The problem is if you scale a model down, you change the Reynolds number. You remember this number that we saw, which is the ratio between inertia forces and viscous forces? You actually change this. Uh, so to keep this number the same, if you cut the size in half, you have to double the velocity, which means that if you want to test a Formula One car, which is going at 300 kilometers per hour in real life, or let's say 200 miles per hour, well, if you want to test it at half the size, you have to test it at double the speed. And this, again, makes for a very complex wind tunnel test because a wind tunnel um, that can handle 400 miles per hour is, first of all, quite difficult and expensive. Second of all, at those speeds, you start to compress the air, which is, again, a different flow regime. So quite tricky to get the test uh, to behave correctly. Now, once you do have your test set up um, all properly, you want to measure the forces. Um, typically, what you do is that you grab your object um, and connect it to what is called a force and moment balance, just like a weighing scale, but in three directions, X, Y, Z. Plus you also measure the torque values, uh, which is the, um, the torque in three different directions around these three axes. And then you just log this um, in function of the speed, the angle of attack of your airplane and so on. Same for a car, by the way. Um, if you want to know how much downforce you have on a race car, um, it's quite difficult to measure this on the ground if the ground of your wind tunnel is moving which is the best solution. Um, so they hold this from the top and actually measure the forces on the car, uh, which is kind of floating um, above the surface, but it's very difficult because you still want that real contact patch of the tire on the ground, but you want to measure the forces. So a very delicate balance there. What you can also do is measure the pressure on different points on the surface of your car. So what you can do is, is drill small holes and on the inside, connect small tubes to it 
and, and I'll lead them to a pressure transducer. They can actually measure the pressures at different locations uh, to know if your airfoil, for example, is behaving the way you want it to. Or you can actually use a laser um, to shine light in a certain direction through the flow. And then with a camera perpendicular to that field of view, um, uh, to that projection direction, you can actually see the incremental motion of different particles. Uh, and if you trace the path of each particle, you can construct a map uh, with velocity vectors. And from that, you can deduct, pre can deduct pressures and so on. So lots of interesting techniques, but nothing stops you from actually getting into aerodynamics yourself. Um, this is a test we did just to play around and to show that you can actually uh, learn aerodynamics with just a few dollars, actually. Um, if you want to know where the airflow separates on your car, for example, or what the pattern is of the airflow, um, you can do something what is called tuft testing. Like tufts are small um, threads uh, that you attach to your uh, the surface of your car or your object. And as you start to speed up, they, they will align with the local direction of the flow. Which means that if you have like an inward or an outward curvature of your flow, you will see this on these uh, tufts. Uh, costs a few dollars and you will learn a ton if you actually do this. Um, you can just mount the GoPro, look at what's happening. Um, really, really interesting to play with this. Um, some case studies. Uh, using simulations, we, we, we can run all kinds of studies uh, for customers or just generic studies like a pickup truck. How can we make it more aerodynamically efficient? Uh, if we add like a rear cover, um, okay, that's that's minus 15% of the drag. That's quite impressive, right? Um, it's not without, uh, well, it's quite obvious that this, this has been one of the reasons for the design of the Tesla Cybertruck, for example. Even though it looks quite funky and chunky, um, it really is uh, this profile that you see. Um, and if you have this nicely sloped profile, you kind of recover some of the pressure that you lost at the front or that you created at the front, which is called pressure recovery, which kind of makes it, flow through the air as, as a wedge, kind of, um, which helps you to reduce drag. Um, a flat underfloor instead of exposed drivetrain components, um, we found 3.4% drag reduction. Wheel covers, you see them on Teslas, it's not just a design gimmick, they actually reduce the drag on Teslas, 3 to 4% is what they say. In this case, we had 2 point something percent. If you take off the mirrors on this car, they're huge, uh, Ford F-150 mirrors, uh, more than 5%. And if you lower the ride height of the car, we found, for example, that this reduced drag by, by 2%. Uh, and this is being done by plenty of car makers. Um, a lot of cars actually dynamically lowered the ride height of their car as they speed up. Because you want to add, you want it to be high uh, at low speeds or when you get in and out of the car uh, for comfort or if you take speed bump, for example. But at high speeds, you want it to be lower uh, for improved aerodynamics, not just for lower drag. We also get more downforce, which is really nice. Uh, so better handling of your car. Other stuff we did, uh, well, we've had fun as well. Uh, we did the aerodynamics of the, the top one, which is a modified Lamborghini. Uh, we did the entire aerodynamics package together with their design, which is really cool. Um, and we lowered the aerodynamic drag, if I remember correctly, of the base Lamborghini by 27%, something like that. Um, and we tweaked the aero balance um, to be not too much the downforce at high speeds because it would just squash your car to the ground and destroy everything. Um, but we, we do need a good balance. And the aero balance is the difference between downforce at the front and downforce at the rear. Because if you have too much downforce at the rear, you don't have much grip on your front wheels and you get like understeer and less control in your car. Um, and the opposite is also not interesting. Um, it has been tested already. Um, it just hit uh, 447 kilometers per hour. Um, and the, we're still going for more, so let's see where we get. Um, we can also use simulations um, for uh, benchmarking of existing car designs. Imagine you're working at Ferrari and you want to know what the Porsche is doing. Well, if you 3D scan the Porsche and run an aerodynamic simulation, you can actually get a very good grasp of this. Um, but today we're here to talk about uh, the super mileage car. Um, so what is we uploaded? Is it working? Yeah. Um, we uploaded or actually uh, Ollie uploaded uh, the car or the 3D model of the car uh, to our platform. Um, one of the cool things is that you don't need to fix all the defaults in your 3D model on our platform. It just works out of the box. Um, it detected the wheels automatically. Um, Ollie also set up the radiator of the car uh, because we want to analyze the flow rate through the radiator. Uh, quite an important topic 
uh, especially for EVs, and then launch the simulation. And this runs in the Google Cloud, uh, where you can get as much power as you want, basically. Uh, so it was done in just a few hours. Um, and if we then, let me just see if this works. Just want to illustrate actually what we saw. So on the first design, we actually saw a lower drag than the second design, but I'll, I'll get to the reasons why this was. The first design had a drag coefficient of 0 0.13, which is definitely good. Um, but what we saw is that in a side profile, you can see this massive upward curvature of the belly um, of the design, uh, which means that the air needs to accelerate to go upwards. And as we saw before, because of Bernoulli's equation, faster moving air will generate low pressure. This low pressure below the car is starting to pull in air from the sides, which means if you look at the bottom velocity profile, uh, the air is not just traversing the car in a parallel way, it's actually curving inward. And your wheels may be nicely parallel and pointing forward, um, but if the air is coming in at an angle, the air needs to cross these wheels sideways. Uh, which means that the air is coming in at this angle. I'm exaggerating a bit now. Oh, sorry. I'm exaggerating a bit, but imagine the air is coming in at this angle. That is why you see a flow separation, which is this red bubble. This is uh, an indication of energy loss actually uh, pointing inward. Uh, same for the rear wheel. So you can see actually that the drag is not just slipstreaming downstream, it's actually uh, towards the center line of the car, which was a very interesting insight. Um, and what we also saw here, for example, is that um, we see these wheel covers, they're nicely shaped around the wheels, but then they're cut off just in the horizontal plane. Uh, very often this happens because maybe you need like uh, four inches of ground clearance. Okay, let's cut it off. Let's be as aerodynamic as we can and then just cut it off, which is not always a good case because um, the air needs to co curve around the wheel cover, but it also wants to curve underneath the wheel cover. And if air needs to go around the sharp edge, it cannot just follow that curvature it's too sharp too aggressive so it will separate which means you get again flow separation which is this red area that you see here um, around the wheel cover I can see my cursor that's good um, so we saw some problems uh, some areas for improvement the thing is that this was a very simplified model um, actually and this is what very uh, what happens often is that you start with a very simple model you just want to uh, benchmark your idea which is very good uh, to benchmark like this shape with like a three-wheeler, for example, just see the relative differences, but you don't take all of the details into account straight away, like, like door handles or panel gaps, um, or actually uh, clearance for the tires, because the tires are just touching the object in this case. Um, so very simplified, very good to get the first grasp, but as you start to detail your car, usually the drag starts to go up. So if you look at the second design, um, it actually has a drag coefficient of 0 0.60, um, which is higher, uh, but probably the other one was even higher if you would have added the details that we have on this car. So you can see the side profile is less aggressive on this car. Um, so we still have inward curvature of the airflow, but it's less pronounced as, we, as what we saw on this, on this car. We now have openings um, for the wheels to actually move and not hit. Uh, uh, the cowling, the covering, and so on. But that causes a lot of flow separation because as the air sees the edge of this, this opening, but suddenly it's, it's just an open cavity, which is full of turbulences and so on. Um, what we also see actually here is very interesting. So the air speeds up underneath the belly, as we saw in the other concept, um, but it speeds up and then the lower moving air is actually hitting this uh, wheel cover, um, which means it wants to dive down already to hit the wheel cover which means in this pocket, uh, you get kind of a recirculation of the airflow. You see this red area here, that's kind of a, a swirl or a location of air, which is kind of trapped between other um, air elements or air trajectories. Um, at the top, so what Ollie did here is to design what is called a NACA duct. So if I just show it like this, a NACA duct is actually like some, some kind of gutter um, which starts small and then opens up. And the goal is that the air kind of tumbles inside. And as it tumbles inside, it gets downward momentum, which is a good way to get more pressure buildup 
into the area that you're feeding, which is typically like an air inlet for an aircraft or an air inlet for a race car or just for cooling the cabin. Um, that's a really nice one. We can actually see that it's working. Uh, so these two red lines that you see here, they do indicate uh, an energy loss, but these are the vortices, the, the vortex structures of the air actually tumbling inside this uh, nakada. So it's working, it's working well. And then it hits actually the opening here and behind this is a radiator. So the radiator actually blocks this channel, which means that you get a pressure buildup in this channel all the way to the front opening, um, which means air cannot just go freely through it. It has to go around to some extent because it's being choked. Um, that's why the air needs to jump out and jump across. And that's why you get flow separation again um, at the edges of this channel. Plus what you also see is that if you look at a side view of this car, this car the NACA duct is actually located in an area where the air is actually going downward, uh, which is very sensitive. So this is a negative curvature. If you trip the air there, as we saw on the golf ball, it's already tricky to keep the air attached to the uh, negative curvature. And if you then add like a disturbance there, it just lets go and it's off. You, you have separated flow and it's very difficult to have it reattach again. Um, so that, that is what we see here. Um, if we then look at some other surface qualities, you can look at the surface pressure. Um, so very interesting to see what happens here. So at the radiator, you can see that you have higher pressure inside this channel uh, and low pressure here as the air accelerates and tumbles into this channel. At the nose, remember when we talked about the sphere where the air hits it, it comes to a complete standstill. We have what is called the stagnation pressure. That's the red that you see here. That is the stagnation pressure. Um, and then we talked about the air accelerating underneath the belly pan um, of, of, the, of the car. Um, especially here, um, because where the car is the lowest, um, there's like, uh, if you make it a slice of the car and the ground, it's actually like a funnel because the nose actually is high up and then it goes down with the belly and then it goes up again. So if you have the same amount of mass uh, that you want to force through that cross section, if the cross section uh, grows smaller, the velocity has to go up. That's what you see um, with the air actually going underneath the car. Um, and that is why race cars also generate downforce because with the front splitter and diffuser, you accelerate the airflow underneath the car. This creates a suction effect, pulling the car down. But in this case, it also has the effect that it pulls in air from the sides of the car. That is why some race cars actually try to seal the sides of the car with like small flaps um, on the sides, for example, to prevent that from happening. Um, if you look at the surface friction, um, because it speeds up the air, you also have more surface friction in that area. Um, and wherever you have separated flow, you have blue areas. Because if the flow is not following the surface anymore, but has separated, it's no longer sliding across the surface. So if you see blue areas in the surface friction map, that usually indicates that you have a problem with the separated airflow. Uh, and this one clearly illustrates that the wake behind this wheel is not aligned with the driving direction, but it's inward because of this effect of the air going to the inside of the car. Um, if you look at streamlines, you can play with this. Um, you can actually drag the streamlines left and right just to see what happens, uh, how it curls around the car, where it speeds up, where it slows down. I can do the same thing uh, with this one um, just to see what happens. Um, I'll skip the noise that's not relevant here. And then we can actually analyze the radiator. So if you click on the radiator, what you see now in the color code is actually the flow through the radiator. Um, keep in mind, the scale is not going from zero. Uh, it's 0.35 to one meters per second. Um, but what you can clearly see is that there's like a hot spot where the air goes faster through the radiator, which is this red area. So remember that this NACA duct was forcing the flow to tumble down, which means you get a high energy or a um, high velocity jet through the middle, uh, going down into the channel. Um, sorry. Uh, which you can kind of see here. So this is the inlet of the channel. And let me just show it like this. This inlet of the channel, and then it goes down. And as it hits the middle, that's where you have the highest uh, velocity value. But that means that the rest of your radiator is actually be under, is being underused. Uh, so if you design an electric car and you have a radiator this big, um, and the hotspot of velocity is just over here, and 50% of the flow is going through maybe 20% of your radiator, you're not utilizing your radiator the way you should be using it, which means you're carrying too much mass 
uh, you can actually improve your design by improving the shape of your ducting uh, to feed more air uh, to the right locations of your radiator. What we can also do then is, is play around with the forces. So we have an interface where you can actually click on separate components to analyze the forces per component. Because if you're designing a car, you often want to know which part is causing most drag. Is it my headlights? Is it the roof? Is it the, is it, is it the trunk? And so on. Keep in mind though, it's not like, oh, let's remove that component and we, 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 we lost some drag. No, that's not true because something else would then be causing drag. Um, still can be quite important. Um, and that's it in a nutshell, actually, um, what we do in general and what we did together with, uh, with Ollie uh, and the team. So questions, shoot. Yes. Yes. Um, so that's one of the most common questions we get, uh, and that makes sense. So what we do is we try to publish validation cases. Um, and because we're talking about cars now, one of our partners um, took apart a Tesla Model Y, uh, component by component. Uh, what they do, they actually do reverse engineering and then kind of spread the knowledge to other car thinkers, which is a bit funny. Um, but this business exists. Um, they take each component out of the car and they make up to 2,000 individual high precision scans, 3D scans of components. And then they take each 3D model and put it back together in one massive full car model. And then we do an analysis on that car. Uh, just to give you an indication of how detailed this is, uh, I have to really zoom in. You can actually read the tire marks on the sidewall of the tires. That's how detailed, detailed these models are. So we ran a simulation on this model and they performed a wind tunnel test. Um, and the delta between their drag value and our drag value was less than 6%, which is actually fairly close. Um, the thing is that if you would run a simulation on our platform, other software packages, you would also see uh, some percents difference. Uh, if you run the same car in different wind tunnels, you will also see a difference uh, because they have their own calibration uh, structure and so on, procedures. This one, for example, you see this white patch here underneath the car? That is a moving ground. Um, because theoretically, the car is moving across the ground, right? Um, but in the wind tunnel, it's the opposite. The car is standing still and the air is moving. So if you want to capture the right effect, theoretically, you need to have the floor of the tunnel moving, uh, which you can do. You can do the full floor uh, moving wind tunnel, um, but it's very expensive. So like a hybrid solution is where they only move the floor in between the wheels because the wheels are very difficult to get correct on, on this moving floor. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we see some pressure uh, or drag deltas between what they did and what we did. Um, but to not limit the discussion uh, to just the drag value, because this 6% could actually be coincidence. Maybe the real delta is 20, we just got lucky, right? Um, so what we also did is we got this, you know, this laser technique that we discussed, the slice through the air. Um, they did this like right behind the car. Uh, you can actually still see the shape of the car kind of in this slice. Um, and we also did this digitally. Uh, and you can see nice similarities, like, like these four structures that you see here are vortices coming off the roof or swirls in the flow. We can actually capture them in the simulation and compare them to what you see in real life. Um, so that's the way you can actually calibrate these things. Um, we have other cases, um, typically for drones or airplanes. Uh, it's the lift which is most important, lift and drag, at different angles of attack. So if you want more lift, typically you start to pull up your nose and you get more lift, right? Um, I'll turn this off. Yeah. Um, and this is the correlation. So uh, on the X axis, you have the angle of attack, which is this angle in the wind. And on the vertical axis, this one features the uh, drag force. So just air resistance. And this one features the lift, which is the upward or downward uh, force that you have. And you can see we have actually quite good correlation uh, between these things. Um, of course, we also have cases where we have uh, a poor correlation, uh, depending on something we cannot model. Imagine there's a certain roughness on the surface we didn't take into account. Okay, then we will have a, a bigger discrepancy, for example. Other questions? Ollie, go ahead. Next, uh, 
Yeah, what you could do, um, you, you can play with the, the curvature that you have there. So now it's kind of tangential with the car and then ties inward. You can you can play with that. Um, now, in general, it's, it's quite difficult uh, to have an air intake at the rear of your car because the air is already in a, in a difficult situation. Um, so you'll actually see energy losses to begin with. If you can put it at the front of your car, um, the flow rate through a radiator is the determined by the pressure delta. So the pressure at the front minus the pressure at the rear. Um, at the front of your car, you have the stagnation pressure to begin with, which is already, it's easy, it's there. The air is just hitting your car, which is why most cars have their radiators at the front. Not always, but mostly. Um, which is which then makes it a matter of getting a nice low pressure at the rear, which means finding the right locations for evacuation channels for your for your uh, outlet of the radiator. Um, so you can still do it at the back, but if there's no dramatic reason why it should be there, I would say put it at the front, actually. Um, and yeah. Maybe so. Yeah, maybe so. Um, also have to look at your weight balance. If you mm -hmm. start putting radiators with liquids and so on at the front. Yeah. Yes, please. Would it be bad? Yeah, 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 it would, it would. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a NACA duct. Um, it could also be like an air scoop, depending on how much cooling you need. Um, because if you don't need a lot of cooling, just make the radiator smaller. That's the simple answer to begin with. Uh, so, so do some thermal calculations to see just how much you need. Um, do some testing maybe. Um, but if you need more performance, uh, you know, like a McLaren F1, for example, uh, the race version has like a scoop on top of the car, um, which just grabs air. And the reason it is a scoop is that um, you want to move it out of the boundary layer because this boundary layer as it develops across the roof of your car, grows thicker, and that's slower moving air, which means you have less momentum, which means you have less pressure buildup and less flow rate through the radiator. So you want to reduce that problem by actually jumping above the boundary layer, but you'll introduce more drag probably. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it depends. Well, very often aesthetics really drive design decisions. However much we want to think as engineers that you start with a good layout and then you do the design. It's not always like that, which, which makes sense. The car needs to look nice. Um, we, we did a project on this one. Uh, see if I can find it. Um, yes, this one. I'll turn off the sound here. So what we did here, we had a, a customer race of a Porsche uh, GT4 or Cayman GT4. Um, and the question was, if I increase my wheel arches, so these are the wheel arches, they, they were fitting bigger tires for racing, uh, but you need to uh, fend uh, or have, have a fender around these tires. So they wanted to increase the width of the fender. Um, and then they wanted to see, oh, but wait, um, we have side air intakes. What's going to happen? Are we going to lose cooling capacity or, or, or horse, horsepower because you have less pressure buildup? Um, so we did an analysis uh, to see what would happen. Um, and we just worked with like, like um, off the shelf 3D models we found on the internet, um, added the wheel arches. Um, and actually the conclusion was that um, if you look at this image, uh, the air which ends up in the side air intake, um, you would you would assume like like okay, side air intake is just air going around the car in the horizontal plane, and that's the air that ends up there. It turned out that most of the air ending up in the side air intakes is actually the air which comes on top of the hood, and then tumbles down the side of the hood, and then gets injected in the side air intakes, which means that widening the fenders um, actually didn't have a negative effect. It actually had a positive effect because that air traveling on the front hood 
actually stayed horizontally for longer because the fenders were wider and then had a bit more momentum or a better flow path to the side air intakes and this actually improved the cooling. Destroyed the drag, obviously, but uh, the cooling was actually improved. So yeah, to answer your question, it depends on the layout, depends on the purpose of the tracing or something else, it depends on design. If you look at a Bugatti Chiron, for example, um, it has so much power to dissipate because it has 1600 horsepower or something. The entire rear end of the car is open. Um, it has 10 or 12 radiators or something, or even more, I don't know. Um, the entire rear end is open to just use that low pressure in the wake of the car to help uh, suck air through the radiators, actually. Um, so the more extreme you go, the more radiators you need, or the more surface, the more delta and so on. And what's also interesting is that if you move to electric cars, um, there's less power to dissipate, actually. But the funny thing is that the, the allowable temperature delta is lower. With, with the combustion engine, uh, the temperature of your cooling liquid is much higher. You just need to keep your, I don't know what it is, maybe around 100 degrees uh, Celsius, uh, your motor or something, or the cooling liquid. For, for batteries, uh, that's way too much. You would destroy them. So you need to keep them at a lower delta, which means you need, again, a bigger radiator um, because you need more cooling uh, to keep the pressure, uh, the temperature delta lower. So no gain, less energy to dissipate, but lower allowable temperature deltas. Go ahead. Yeah. So the conventional way of running simulations like this is that you you take your 3D model, you, you have to clean it up, get get rid of all the edges and holes and problem areas. Uh, for us, that's not necessary. We can handle those. And then you start to create your first mesh. Um, refine locally, as we saw, closer to the surface and so on. So it's an iterative process, uh, which takes you time. And if you master it, OK, you can do it quite, uh, quite efficiently. Um, but our platform is aimed at people who do not necessarily have the time or the knowledge or, or whatever um, budget to actually do this. So we have an adaptive mesh refinement process, which means that, first of all, based on experience, we will already have a mesh which is more refined around sharp edges and so on. And then we do our first simulation with, let's say, half the number of cells that we want to end up with in the end. We let that simulation converge, and then we ask the software to refine the mesh locally there where it's most needed, which is called adaptive mesh refinement because you adapt to the actual flow pattern that you see. Um, and then we look at parameters like the gradient of pressure. If you see that the pressure is suddenly rising a lot in a short over across a short distance, then yeah, this is because the air is hitting like the, the front nose of something or the slow separation. So we refine it. And if you see that you have high, high um, vorticity or curl or swirls in the flow, you can also easily analyze this. Um, that means you're in the wake of a car or something. And it's, it's important to capture the wake properly. So we also refine based on the wake of the car. Um, and so this is not accessible in terms of tweaking the process. But what we do provide is that after every simulation, and Oli can actually download this as well, we provide this full simulation data, which includes the mesh. So you can actually see the end result of our automated meshing procedure. Um, just to see where it was refined. If, if if you look in a problem area and you want to be sure, is this a mesh related problem or is it a real physical problem? You can just open the mesh and, and judge yourself. Um, we stick to one domain size. Um, because that one, you can actually guess quite accurately, first of all. Second of all, because the cells are very big, as you move further away from the object, you can be, use really big cells, and that doesn't cost you much. So if you want to scale the tunnel from um, by a factor two, for example, it will not cost you um, double in terms of number of cells. It's quite cheap to do this. So what we do is, if this is your object, for example, and this is the wind direction, we look at the cross-sectional area, like we saw for the blockage factor of the wind tunnel, and um, we, instead of calculating the blockage factor um, after the facts, we do the opposite. We calculate your frontal surface area of your object, and then we size the wind tunnel up, um, uh, around it so that the blockage factor is just 1%. And even then, we still apply corrections uh, for the blockage factor. 
And then there's also the lengthwise sizing of the wind tunnel. Typically, a rule of thumb is that upstream, let's say one and a half times the length of your object, downstream five to ten, depending on what you're used to. Um, that's that's quite common. Um, we had thought of doing this automatically, but the gain is actually very low, um, and it's too easy to just yeah make it a bit bigger. It wasn't doesn't cost too much. What do you mean with model visibility? Wait, I have this open actually. Okay, you mean if you want to look inside a model or anything or? Oh yeah, it's always the same. We use steady state simulation with a K Omega SST terminals model. Um, which is a good blend between cost, accuracy, and speed. You can go much more accurate with LES, DES, or anything. But then again, uh, this is a general purpose platform meant to provide stable simulation results. Um, if you do that with LES, with layers, and so on, it becomes very difficult to guarantee. We can do it behind the scenes, but not as a default. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, quite a lot. Um, difficult to put an exact number on that because, yeah, running without wheels is just an unrealistic comparison. But um, we actually see that you can improve your drag on a car quite a lot by tweaking the airflow around the wheels. Um, one of the typical tricks is what they call an air curtain. Um, if I go back to the Lamborghini project. Can you see this? Yeah. You see this large opening here on the side of the bumper? Uh, actually, what happens is at the front of the bumper where you have the high stagnation pressure, um, you use that pressure and you, you force the air through a small channel inside the bumper, which is like a converging channel, which means that the air will speed up. Uh, and then you use that jet to actually um, curve around the wheels so that you get, literally get like a curtain of air so that the, the air uh, close to the wheel doesn't get chopped up just as much um, in a, as in a normal situation. That's one of the tricks. Another trick is that you can use air deflectors. So the bottom of the car is, is has a certain uh, ground clearance, right? Um, but just the head of the wheel. Um, so if, if this is the wheel, for example, and this is the, the front nose, the air actually sees this lower bit of the car and hits it directly which causes a big wake around the wheel. But if you add like a small vertical flap or a curvature uh, at the bottom of your bumper, just ahead of the wheel, you actually force the air to already go down before it hits the wheel, which means that you avoid most of that direct impact on the tire and the wake around the tire is actually reduced. Um, then there's wheel covers, uh, as we mentioned, uh, three to 4% drag reduction on, on, a, on a Tesla, for example, those are, um, accepted values. We also saw in our simulations that this really helps. Uh, so yes, wheels are really important. Sometimes they even cover them completely on the outside, like a Tesla Semi, for example, the truck has, uh, to some extent, wheel covers. Uh, the Lightyear one, which was a very aerodynamic solar vehicle, also had covered wheels. Um, the Aptera, which is a company here in California, um, who, who, who are also using Air Shaper, they also have covered wheels uh, to reduce this effect. So yes, very important. Okay, go ahead. Well, the thing is that um, I would actually look at the airflow pattern. Uh, let's go back to this one. So. At the front, there are no covers at the moment. Um, so there I would work with the air deflectors like we just discussed. Um, and also I see that the, the clearance for the wheels is a lot. I don't know if you need that much clearance. If you really do, okay, then, then you need to live with it. Maybe you can add like a rubber flap or something for those cases where the wheel does need to go uh, to that extent. But usually you have so much clearance uh, for 0.005% of the time when you hit the bump or you have like the maximum travel of your suspension. But most of the time you will have like two inches of clearance. So maybe you can just add a cover or something. 
uh, to reduce that. That would be one thing. Um, it's kind of hard to change the angle of the wheels, uh, so you're stuck with that. Um, but at the rear, for example, um, one of the things that you could consider is that you kind of um, point the wheel cover slightly inward because you still see some inward direction of the flow. Uh, so what you can do is download the simulation results and in a program called Paraview, uh, you can make your own analysis of the airflow. Uh, you can also use these streamlines uh, just actually to see at the bottom. You see, the natural airflow is kind of curved inward here. I don't know if you can see that properly. It's, it's contracting the airflow. And then it hits the side of these wheel covers. And you can actually clearly see this. It hits the side and it has to speed up, which is this, this area here. So it's speeding up because it hits the side and needs to go around this wheel cover. And on the inside, this streamline is actually going wide uh, because it actually wants to go like this. It has to cross the wheel section uh, and you get this flow separation here. Um, so even though your wheel is pointing forward, your wheel cover uh, could actually be pointing um, inward towards the tail. Slightly, not too much. That could be one option. Um, yeah, that's something that I will play with. Uh, just look at the natural airflow. Go ahead. You also mentioned the Um, what we did for Aptera, um, you mean this horizontal one, right? Yeah. So you can actually curve this upward to some extent, um, or you can add like a round uh, uh, on the edge of the cover. But of course, if you add a round, yeah, you, you contract your opening again. So you might as well just contract everything in that case. Um, it's difficult to get away with this, um, but if you look at um, Aptera, uh, let me just see. Um, this one. This is um, a video we made for Aptera, which they're using in their uh, campaigns sometimes. Um, what we did here, I'll just fast forward a bit. The, the simulation streamlines that you see are based on real simulation results. Um, so what we're showing now is the same as what I showed you in the viewer, so we have the streamlines. Um, now we get the pressure map. No, pressure clouds, sorry. And now we get the pressure map on the surface. Um, sorry, actually, you can actually see that they have similar challenges, right? You see, that's the wake behind the front wheels, the exposed part on the ground. This is the wake coming off the suspension. This is the wake on the rear wheel. Um, and we also have a bit of our software which can automatically optimize the shape of a vehicle. So if we ask the software, please, within a certain design space, which is this box that you see here, optimize the shape so that we have lower drag, it will go through its own set of cycles to actually do so. Um, and we did that on the front wheel cover. And the green is actually the displacement. So what we saw here is that the software was pushing the front of the wheel cover inward and the rear of the wheel cover outward. And the reason for this is that the main airflow around the vehicle is curving around the main bodywork is going outward, which means that your approach angle to the wheels is not just zero, it's actually an outward angle, uh, the opposite of what you have, which is an inward angle uh, for some of the wheels. So the uh, approach angle was outward, uh, meaning that um, if you align the wheel covers to kind of point towards the nose at the front, you actually reduce the drag, which is counterintuitive, right? Because you would just take a wheel and then look at the wheel as an isolated component and just draw something around it, which looks like a drop shape. Uh, but then if you take the full car into account, you kind of have to align the wheel covers. And we did the same, at, which is same question as what you have. So you can see here, they had the same thing. They had an aerodynamic cover and it was cut off at the ground level. Um, in their case, I'm not saying it's gonna be the same for you, but the software suggested, instead of just having a, a two-dimensional in the horizontal plane, uh, two-dimensionally optimized uh, drop shape around your cover, to actually look at the vertical plane as well and have this nicely curved approach uh, to your wheel covers. Um, and this reduces the amount of separation that you have. But different car, different design, your solution might be different. Other questions? Yes. We're now actually in the development process of an internal flow solver. Yes. So what we have already today is that if it's connected to the outside world, 
or to the external aerodynamics, if you're, if the gap is big enough so that our mesh can fit inside, it will, it will actually mesh it just like the flow through the radiator that we saw. Well, it's actually an internal flow. It's just connected to the outside air. Then we can mesh it. Uh, we, we are now working on a tool which we will hopefully launch soon, where you can just say, okay, this is an internal set of pipes. This is an inlet. This is an outlet. This pressure or velocity uh, constraint, solve it. And, and then we can do uh, air conditioning simulations in cars, for example. Um, we can do flow through pipes, pressure drops, bumps, and so on. That's to be released.